Hello everyone, hope you're having a great day today. Today we are at Landmark Inn. It's a bed and breakfast, but it's also a historical site. So we're gonna go in and check it out. trip by wagon and this is interesting how oh they never mind things were removed. Never mind. Here's the Vance Hotel, the blueprint of it. So you can actually stay here. To take the tour, it's $4 per person. That's not bad. Okay, so let's go on the tour now. 
Welcome to Landmark Inn State Historic Site in Casterville, Texas. My name is David Gravitsky. I'm the site manager here at the Landmark Inn. And today we're going to take a tour and we're going to learn about three things. Settlement, industry, and historic preservation through the eyes of two different groups of people. Alsatians, who were the core group that came with the early colonists, and the Fremda. If you've never heard of the Fremda, Fremda is the Alsatian word for not Alsatian. Hmm. We are going to be going up and down a little bit because we're on the banks of the beautiful Medina River Valley. And uh, if we need an alternate route, just let me know and we will accommodate that. Yes, so if you'll follow me, we'll head on out and talk about settlement. We're walking down the San Antonio to Chihuahua Road. This is one of the roads established to access the silver mines in Mexico. Hmm. There was a freight road that took freight from San Antonio westward and brought raw materials from the west to San Antonio. So looking straight ahead, you can see the cut in the trees there. This is the path of the original road that came west from San Antonio. Crossed through a, uh, a, a, an absolutely blue, crystal blue uh, river, according to Frederick Law Olmsted, who visited here in 1854, on white limestone uh, board, uh, you know, rock on the bottom of the river. This location for Castroville was uh, deliberately chosen by Henry Castro. Henry Castro was an impresario, um, so he was under contract with the Republic of Texas to bring a certain amount of settlers by a certain amount of time to Castroville. Um, he had been born Moise Enriquez de Castro and had shortened his name so that he could rise in society in France during the French Revolution and the Napoleonic period. He uh, became something of an ambassador and, and uh, worked in finance for becoming an impresario. He chose this spot deliberately uh, because it was about exactly a day's wagon journey from San Antonio. So it's almost a planned excerpt in, in modern thinking. Um, planned to be here because of the fresh water that goes in a horseshoe shape around Casterville and uh, the good breezes and uh, available building materials and um, there were many advantages here. This crossing point on the Medina River had been a, a gathering place for peoples of all kinds throughout the ages. American Indians, as well as uh, the settlers and rangers and everybody else who passed through this part of Texas often came through here because of the natural ford in the river. Hmm. Hmm. This transportation route has been important over time. Uh, not just because of the Ford, but when automobiles came in, a bridge was built. And you can see the dressed stone by the tree there. Um, so there was a, a, a bridge that spanned the river. It had two Pratt through trusses that were 100 feet each. And then it had a 252 foot Parker tension span that crossed the main channel of the river. The abutments remain on our side and on the other side of the river. The piers and other parts of the bridge have been removed. If you look at the current bridge, it is not one bridge, but three. If you look carefully underneath, um, you'll see a, a wide span that has a, a metal uh, girder on top of uh, concrete piers. That was one of the last wow. WPA projects here in Medina County. It was built. Um, 1940, 1942. In 1978, the bridge was widened by placing concrete sister spans on either side of the 1940 bridge and putting one deck over the top of the three different bridges. Wow. So this this is a pecan tree here. Right. And uh, it's probably a daughter of the one that stood where the, the sign is over there, just across the path on that 
swatch of grass, there was a, a very large ancient pecan tree. Hmm. And it was there on September 12th of 1844 that the citizens of Casterville met to write out the charter, the terms by which they would all live together. That tree lived until 1985 when it was toppled in an ice storm. And the uh, prior operator of the site, the Texas Park and Wildlife, had the foresight to harvest that tree and have it turned into a table. That table we brought back out and set where the tree had been uh, last year on September 12th, which was a Thursday last year, and it was a Thursday in 1844. Hmm. We had the current city council last year sit around that table oh, wow. for, for a ceremonial 175th anniversary. Wow. So in case you didn't hear, this table is part of a pecan tree that stood outside when it, the town was formed, right? That is neat. So the, the building is the wash house here on site. And it probably is our oldest building dating to 1847. It may have been a Sunday house, but it is typical of of what happened when the settlers arrived. Henry Castro provided a lot in town on which to build a home, and he also provided a uh, farm outside of town. Michelle and Rosina Simone from Halvrin in Alsace, so the Air Alsatians, built um, at least the lower portion of the, the building, mm -hmm. um, and it may have been their Sunday house. So they would have worked on their farm during the week, come in on Saturday to do their trading, sleep in the house overnight, and go to church on Sunday. That's the name of the Sunday house. Wow. It sits on uh, lot number two. On lot number three, uh, which we don't go in, but it, it's another example, that is uh, uh, Michelle and Marie Kaufman, also Alsatians. And, uh, uh, they built that as a Sunday house and their descendants are still around today and they often recall how uh, their ancestors only brought some of their children to stay overnight in that house, joking that maybe they had too many. But the reality was, as, as they'll quickly point out, that uh, some of the children had to remain behind in order to milk the cows on hmm. Sunday morning. all the herbs that are drying. Thank you. I'm going to open this for a little bit more light. We are standing in the um, Manat kitchen. It was probably built in 1849. If not, it was in 1850. The Manads came and purchased lot number one on which we're standing from uh, Henry Castro um, in September of 1849 and built a, a stand. Stand is maybe a word that we're not familiar with today. Um, we tend to think of the word store. Um, so you, when you go to the store, maybe it's uh, Walmart or Home Depot or one of the others. Um, in the 1840s and 50s, we probably would have called it a stand. Hmm. The stand uh, had a bar as well as some uh, uh, retail merchandise that they provided to travelers on the road uh, to Chihuahua coming from San Antonio. This building uh, probably housed the Menad's uh, uh, servant, uh, whose name is Harriet, and uh, she was enslaved by the Menad's and seems to have had an 18-month-old toddler with her. So you can imagine a young 22-year-old woman with a toddler who has no freedom uh, in this space, and she would be here three times 365. Mm -hmm. So I'm standing at the door. Mm -hmm. 
about 10 by, well, 20 by 20 maybe? Uh, probably 16 by 20. 16 by 20? Um, and of course, the story of Harriet brings up an interesting discussion about Benina County during the Civil War. Um, even though slavery was practiced in the county, Medina was one of the counties that did not vote for secession. They opted to remain loyal to the Union. Um, some of the men were conveniently gone from Castorville. Uh, when Confederate authorities came for draft and conscription. Yet, uh, others like our neighbor across the street, uh, Valentin Haas, uh, was said to have rushed into San Antonio to enlist the Confederate cause immediately. Uh, John Vance, who operated the hotel after the Menads um, left, uh, resigned as United States Postmaster, because of course the United States Postmaster Postal Service did not continue here during the four years of the rebellion. And, um, and yet he became postmaster almost immediately after the Civil War was over. Let's stop here for just a moment and take a look at this building. When Caesar Menad and Hannah Menad, his wife, built the building in 1849, it was just the, the first floor and out to about the double doors on the L wing. They uh, continued to operate this until February of 1853 when John and Rowena Vance bought it. And they immediately elongated the L. And they also built up the buildings that are now in ruin in between the, uh, the inn building and the house. The house was built in March of 1859 because Rowena Vance uh, was one of the best trained and most skilled people of her day. Um, the best school in America in her day for boys was Harvard, and the best for girls, because they segregated the sexes in those days, um, was the Charlestown Female Seminary. So Harvard is in Cambridge, just outside of Boston, and Charlestown is on the other side of the Charles River from Boston. Rowena is from Vermont, and her husband John had been born in Ireland, but as a youth came to America and often thought of his home as New York City. Um, when they first were married in, in San Antonio and had two children and bought the, um, uh, the Monad property in February of 1853. Now put yourself in, in this position. You're one of the best trained, best educated people of your day. And uh, you're a newlywed with two little children and you move into the back of Walmart to set up your house. This is what Rowena did. The family quarters are these two uh, doors here on the lower level, the two green doors that you see. And so in March of 1859, the Vances built this very fine house uh, for their family to live in. The last addition that they made um, uh, to the property was to add the second floor roughly in 1873. We think in anticipation of the railroad uh, that could have arrived here in, in Castorville but ultimately bypassed the community in 1881. Uh, John Vance altered his business model to include uh, hotel rooms which we still rent uh, as a part of our program. So if you've ever felt guilty about sleeping through history in high school, you can come to Landmark Inn and, and do it with a clean conscience. <laughs> the, uh, the two buildings that are now in ruins, um, the front half of the long one was a stable. The front two-thirds, there was a wall. And then in the back of it, the back one-third, there was um, a kitchen. The smaller ruin, just behind it, was a dining room. And it had lattice work on one side and trellis work on the other. Um, it was a very distinctive place to come and have a, a warm meal. And so when the Vances bought it, they, they converted probably the, the Simone Sunday house into a wash house. It was very fashionable in San Antonio in the 1850s. Um, many wash houses, commercial wash houses were built. And you could, for a few cents, purchase a bath 
um, or pay several dollars for a season ticket uh, to go. And uh, uh, it's quite possible that, that John Vance, uh, having grown up in the business environment of, of San Antonio as a young man, saw that as a, a great uh, extra value uh, to his businesses and, and could have converted the Sunday house into a wash house just because that was the trend in San Antonio. In 1854, the south ends of the, the lots here, lots one and two, were sold to George L. Cass and Lawrence Quintle, um, entrepreneurs who wished to build a mill. Um, they hired the state's premier mill architect, a man by the name of David Monroe from Seguin, uh, to build the grist mill that you see here. Um, this grist mill had additional parts to the building, uh, which you can see in the picture and in the line drawing. The picture and line drawing are from the perspective of across uh, the, the tail race out on the island. So we're, you can see both sides of the building kind of at the same time. Immediately um, when the grist mill began, uh, they also had a cotton gin. Hmm. So it was more than just grain that was being processed here, but also cotton. Um, the newspaper that evaluated it, the Western Texan, in November, the November 23rd, 1854 edition, said that this mill um, was so well done that it was worth your time to travel 100 miles in any direction to come see it. 100 mile journey in 1854 would be about five days. Wow. So imagine taking a week off of work to come see this mill and then another week off of work just to return home. That's how special they felt this mill was, how technologically advanced and, and well done. It cost $8,000 to erect the dam and the 400 foot underground uh, head race that carries the water from the dam into the mill. You can see that in the, the line drawing here. So here's here's the dam. It pushes water into an intake and it comes down this 400 foot long channel all the way down to the mill where the, the wheel is. There is a relief channel that takes excess water out. By adjusting the upper sluice gate and the lower sluice gate you can maintain a consistent level of, of water through the building. Now we are also um, in an area that um, is near the line of semi-aridity, which is an important factor in American settlement. On one side of the line, west of it, is too dry to grow conventional crops, but you can have animals. On the east of it, you can grow crops. And that line moves, not because people push it in any one direction, it just moves on its own. And coincidental with American settlement in the 1850s, the line was moving westward. And so you'll hear Americans talking about this idea of rain follows the plow. Well, after the Civil War, that line of semi-aridity moved back east. And so occasionally, the Medina River runs much lower than it does today. It never completely goes dry, but it runs much lower. And so, in 1879, Joseph Curran bought the large uh, boiler that you see down below here. It's the large tube, um, so that he could generate steam to drive the engines of, of the mills. And when the water returned to uh, enough volume, Joseph Curran, ever the entrepreneur, used it to push water through water mains into the city for fire hydrants. Hmm. Now, in addition to grinding grain and processing cotton, there were two other products that were processed here as well. There was a wool press, so taking wool from sheep and, and preparing it for shipment uh, to, to mills to be made into clothing. 
And then there was also a shingle factory, which is this low stone wall right here. If you want to walk down, we'll, we'll go down and take a look at okay. it. Um, the, the wool press and the cotton gin were right here in what you can see is kind of a ruin of a building. You can see that there are um, uh, footings for a, piers in the, in the grass. Do you see them? Mm -hmm. And there are corresponding ones down below, which we'll see in a moment. And so there would have been a post on top of those that held up the floor that sat on the corresponding uh, footers on the other side. And so it wasn't really a basement, but just a flat floor that held the wool press uh, beyond the double trees there, and then the cotton gin uh, much closer to us for the, uh, for the joists. Yeah. That in there? yeah. And, um, this is one of the most iconic and favorite spots for weddings here at the Landmark Inn. So we are standing inside the 1854 grist mill, uh, the work of David Monroe Seguin. And uh, in here, um, the, the spot that you're looking at right now would have been two runs of uh, grinding wheels. Uh, grain was brought here and then converted mostly into cornmeal. Uh, we're able to increase production here over the years significantly because um, periodically the Medina River flooded and uh, uh, damaged equipment. And so uh, equipment was replaced um, periodically and updated. So even though the railroad never made it through Casterville, um, this is one of the few mills I've ever been to that continue to flourish despite not getting the railroad. Hmm. So originally there would have been a uh, undershot water wheel right here and from our perspective it would be turning counterclockwise with a horizontal drive shaft that would run under our feet. And you can see where the original height of the floor was some 10 inches below where we are. Joseph Coran raised the floor uh, to reduce flooding that happened. In fact, in, in September of 2018, we did have a flood and it came up just below the floorboards that we're standing on. Mm -hmm. In 1866, Stephen S. Brown mortgaged the um, turbine that you see sitting out on the grounds next to the boiler. And uh, that was installed here in the mill and converted the horizontal drive shaft to a vertical drive shaft. Vertical drive shafts uh, have greater efficiency from a, if you look at it from a stem point of view. The kinetic, kinetic energy in the water transfers to the mechanical energy of, of the, uh, the wheel and the drive shaft. So it's much more efficient. The wheel that you see today um, was installed by uh, Joseph, uh, uh, Jordan T. Lawler. Once the Korans had uh, run their course in, in, in the milling industry here, um, and Joseph Coran was looking to liquidate his assets, his wife had gone to Houston and had died of a, a cerebral hemorrhage at the age of 59. And he, being older than she, um, probably understood that uh, soon his assets would pass to his seven children and it was much easier to divide money than it was land. So he sells the milling property to Jordan T. Lawler uh, who converts this mill into hydroelectric. Jordan T. Lawler makes a lot of changes to the property at that time. He uh, uh, moves things that are not needed for um, producing electricity, um, but then he adds a lot of concrete work that you see right here. And if you look real careful, 
you can probably see the rings of the tree that form, made the board that formed the concrete. So all the concrete work that you see around the site is the product of Jordan T. Waller's work. Hmm. Waller was a progressive and had been born in New Orleans, came to Texas, um, and wanted to provide basic utilities to as many people as possible. For cities that couldn't develop their own basic utilities, he would develop them for them and then sell the power plant or whatever it was to the city of Klaus. He did so in Bryan and in Savinal. Um, it seems like he was active also in Round Rock and other places in Texas. But this was his, his final work. Um, and he began generating electricity in 1927. It was available every night of the week and all day on Tuesday. Any idea why all day on Tuesday? It's just that a day, no. <laughs> well, he didn't have as many appliances as we do now, for one thing. Right. And the appliance that they did have needed to operate on Tuesday. For the mill? No, not for the mill, but uh, in the home. So the, the uh, um, uh, doing household chores still was in play in the 1920s. You washed on Monday and you ironed on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And so the new appliance, the new electric appliance of the electric iron was needed every Tuesday. That's why it was available all day on Tuesday. Hmm. But generally didn't have lights on. We don't have lights on during the day in the house, right? But we have things like a refrigerator and microwave and other appliances that we need power for inside our house today. And so that's why electricity is available 24-7. But in 1927, without all those other appliances, we really only needed it all day. This is the reward for the tour on a hot day. We come into the parlor of the Vance house where it is air conditioned and cool. You may sit anywhere you like. These chairs and tables are not historic. They do come from the period, hmm. but they have no stories associated with them. So we have discussed settlement, and we have discussed industry, and so now um, we'll take a moment to talk about historic preservation. We have also met uh, Alsatians along the way, the Karans uh, were Alsatian as well, um, but most of the rest that we've mentioned, the Manaz, the Vances, and others, the Wallers, um, are all what might be considered friends of uh, non Alsatians. Ruth Lawler um, was the youngest child in the Lawler family. Her brother Jordan, whom we met in the mill, was the oldest. There was 21 years between the two, and there were three other siblings in between them. Ruth Lawler was a teacher and taught here in Castorville. And she became very excited in 1936. There was a major event in Texas history in 1936. It was the centennial of the 1836 revolution. In her oral history, she mentions talking to her brother Jordan about wanting to do some preservation work here at the landmark Inn. And Jordan, of course, is absolutely committed to providing basic utilities to uh, common people. And so he says no to her request. She wanted to restore things here at the Landmark Inn. Her first project came then in 1937. So if history teaches us one thing about Miss Ruth, it's that you do not say no to her. She will find the money, which she took out of her teacher pension account, and she bought all of the wood and hired the carpenter and restored the veranda on the back of the inn. 
1937. In 1944, uh, the site wins its very first historic preservation award and has since won uh, numerous other preservation awards for her work uh, here and, and the work of her successors, including the Texas Historical Commission in 2018, won an award recognizing its historic preservation work on the restoration in 2015. After Ruth retired, um, uh, I'm actually should back up just a second. Uh, Ruth uh, reopened the Landmark Inn on July 4th, 1942, which was the same day that the Hondo Army Airfield opened in, in Hondo, um, which is another place if you can go there and, and, and visit, I highly recommend it. Um, the terminal building has a small museum in it, and the concrete that was laid back in 1942 uh, set a record for the amount of concrete laid in, in that short amount of time, three months, wow. 90 days. They, they built all the runways there. And, and the Hondo Army Airfield trained navigators in 14,000 for World War II. So Ruth reopened Landmark Inn the same day that the Hondo Army Airfield opened on July 4th, 1942, to serve the families of airmen who were trained either in Hondo or at Lackland. And she kept the inn open after World War II. Um, she and, and Jordan continued to live in the inn, and they then also renovated this building. This building um, was sold to the Korans in 1899, and the, the Korans removed all of the walls inside of this building to turn it into a warehouse. Ruth Lawler used a fire insurance map from 1860 to determine where the walls and doors, et cetera, were inside of this, this building. In 1958, late in that fall, October, um, Ruth Lawler and her brother Jordan moved into this house and lived here the rest of their lives. And that allowed more of the, the end to be reopened um, for, for rooms. Jordan Lawler passed away in 1970, and Ruth wanted to ensure that all of her excellent historic preservation work would endure. So she donated the entire property to the state of Texas. And the state of Texas placed it in the Texas Park and Wildlife Department and uh, granted Ruth life tenancy, which means that she got to live here until she died in December of 1990. Would you like to see the, yeah. the rooms? So mm -hmm. the way this house was originally designed, the room that we're in is considered the family parlor. This is not where the public would come to see Mrs. Vance. There was another parlor, uh, which is where a bathroom lives today. And uh, that is where we as guests in 1859, 60, et cetera, would have been shown into that space. We would not have come back here to the family's private quarters. This is where the Vances would have taken all of their meals, read the newspaper, played games, and lived their family life here. There was the central hall that had three bedrooms on it. Two remain. Jordan. Baller's room. And then uh, Ruth's room, which is still in her favorite color. from one of Rowena's grandchildren who remembers staying with grandma and sneaking out of their bedroom and, and going underneath the grand piano in the parlor and listening to grandma play. The mm -hmm. grandchild said, I don't think grandma ever knew. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure that Rowena, being one of the most trained and skilled people of her day, probably knew all about it and realized that 
that uh, her own child um, would take possession of the grandchild later. And, um, like many grandparents do, um, you know, humor their, their grandchildren. Yeah. There would have been a third bedroom on the other side of the wall. Wow. You can imagine coming in the front door here and coming into the parlor. Probably would have been an arch maybe in the in the hallway that would tell you it's a very common architectural feature. Right. The arch to tell you that's where the private house begins and you don't pass that. Well, what about the stairs? So those were added. Um, we're not sure if uh, if Rowena had you know a loft upstairs, but Ruth certainly added those. Um, and there was an interior staircase that she also added. You can see in the floor there, there was a stairway that went, you can see where the floor is patched, where the stairway went downstairs into the warehouse where we were before. And she had an electric chair that um, ran down the steps that would carry her down oh, to the basement. Right. She had an office down there, where, which is where she wrote apparently many of her uh, historical books that, that she did about the city of Castorville. Wow. When uh, TPWD owned the property, they had cots up there for Boy Scouts, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so if you brought your wife and children with you, you and your wife would stay in the room and your kids would be up in, in the cots. Thank you for taking time with us today at Landmark Inn State Historic Site. We've enjoyed your visit. We've gotten to hear about settlement, industry, and historic preservation. And through the eyes of the people who lived here, the Alsatians, and those who weren't Alsatian. Many other peoples lived in Castorville. It's a remarkably diverse community, uh, but it's well known as the Little Alsace of Texas. Thanks for joining us at your Texas Historical Commission State Historic Site.